Hey everyone, it's Dr. Tim and Hillary for another session of Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast, a question and answer. How are you doing this morning, Hillary? Doing good. We've got a bunch of questions. I think we missed our Q&A session last month, so yep, making up for it today. Up. Yep. All right, well, let's jump in then. All right. Question number one, can you dose phytoplankton with waste away gel in place and dosing eco balance each week? Yes. Dosing phytoplankton is not going to affect the gels at all. The eco balance and waste away, we don't recommend dosing those two at the same time because it's two types of bacteria and you risk overdosing. Um, but you can dose them separately on separate days, a couple of days apart. If anything, phytoplankton might even consume a little bit of the bacteria, but yep, no problem dosing those together. All right. That first one was easy. I like that. I think that's probably the easiest of all the questions we have. <laughs> Great. Softball up front. <laughs> All right, question number two, what would your primary choice be? A fishless cycle using ammonium chloride and Dr. Tim's one and only, or Dr. Tim's one and only using fish. Could you please elaborate as to why? Well, I don't have a, a favorite. It depends on the situation. And it's also depends on your pocketbook and what your plans are. If you're gonna have a couple of fish, say, you're going to have a better in a bowl by itself. Put in a two ounce bottle of one and only and put the fish in and you're good to go. Why? You've got one fish and you've added a lot of bacteria. So the ammonia the fish is going to excrete is going to easily be handled by the large amounts of bacteria in two ounces of one and only. But conversely, say you're going to stock a large marine aquarium with a bunch of large, you know, groupers and carnivores, a big biomass, and you're going to feed a lot. Well, unless you want to spend a lot of money on several gallons of one and only, you're going to need to build up the population. So in that case, I do a fishless cycling, add the bacteria, add the ammonia, get the cycle established and then add my fish. So there's no one right answer. It all depends upon the situation. Another thing is time. If you've got to move a tank, tanks busted, or just you're, you just are under a time constraint, then adding more bacteria and adding the fish is going to be better because you just don't have the 10 days to fishless cycle. And in that case, cut back on the amount of feeding we do feed our fish too much. They can go a couple of days without food easily or a little bit of food. Make sure, as we've talked about, that it's got a, um, you've cleaned out all the organics because the organics decay into more ammonia. And uh, you'll have to do a cycling you know, with fish and just be careful. So no, no one answer fits every situation there. E each one of them works. That's it. I think that's it. That's a good answer. I like that. There's, and this goes for all aquarium keeping. I think there's no set by the book. This is how you have to do it every single time. It always varies with everything. Yeah. There's no, you know, this is how you have to do it. Even if you're, you know, your kids are real excited. You're getting a 20 gallon setup. You're going to get some zebra Danios, some uh, tiger barb, you know, just a nice little community freshwater tank. Add four ounces. Yeah, it's 20, 20 gallons and four ounces will dose 60, but you can't overdose one and only. So buy yourself a little bit of frustration band-aid there. <laughs> add, you know, add overwhelm the system with nitrifying bacteria, add your fish and let your kids enjoy. Don't let them overfeed, but they can have the fish in the tank and uh, the situation will work fine and limit the amount of feeding for the first week or two and uh, you'll go through the cycle and you'll be fine with the fish in the tank and with the one and only all right good advice okay question number three it's a multi-part question i'm a little confused about eco balance should i be using it after water changes are there products that you recommend to be used after water changes and if so should they be used on occasion or after every water change 
how often should beneficial bacteria be replenished? Well, there's lots of questions within that one big question. <laughs> so let's talk about water changes. After at doing a water change, I definitely recommend using a little bit of first defense that treats the water, adds some uh, stress relief. If you've really stirred up the substrate, cleaned the walls, and there is a lot of material floating around in the water, then I would add some clear up because that's a fl natural flocculant that'll help clear the water. Then if, if you've gone crazy, I mean, really cleaned it, scrub the tank, chances are you've disrupted the nitrifying population. And in that case, you're probably going to want to add a little bit of one and only. You'll know because you might see a bump in ammonia or nitrite, but uh, you, know, you can tell. So those would be the three to consider after every water change, a little bit of first defense, maybe some clear up, maybe some one and only. Um, now, equal balance and waste away, I don't really recommend after a water change. I would wait a few days before adding either one of those. And I said, I said earlier, don't add both of them together on the same day because you're going to uh, um, overdose the tank with bacteria. So just one. And normally, equal balance would be about a once a month. It's a kind of insurance. It's probiotic bacteria that are getting in there and trying to crowd out some bad bacteria and it fights the buildup of these bad bacteria, vibrios in salt water and um, columaris in fresh water. Waste away is more of a sludge degrader. But the reason I say don't add those two right after a water change is you've disrupted things, especially if you've uh, siphon cleaned or stirred up the gravel, the sand bed or coral bed. I think I've mentioned this. When you do that, you risk releasing a lot of nutrients in the, into the water that are trapped in that substrate. And that's why after people clean a tank or disturb their sand bed, they'll say, oh, my water turned cloudy. You know, I had or got whitish cloudy or something happened. And that's because you're getting a bacterial bloom because all those nutrients that were trapped in the substrate are now released up into the oxygenated water and the bacteria start feeding on them. So if that's happening, the one thing you don't want to do is add more bacteria to the situation at that point. So don't add those two within 48 hours of a water change. That is good advice. Excuse me, I got a little tickle in the throat here. Apologize for that. All right. Question number four. During the cycling process, should I leave my power heads on or turn them off? Does it matter? Oh, it matters. You need water flow. So you want your power heads on. You want your filter on. Got wave makers. You want lots of water flow into the system. So keep them on. Yep. That's the easy one. And why it matters is because you need to get the bacteria distributed through the system. Then once they're established, <coughs> sorry about that, not a good day. Um, you want to bring them oxygenated water and move through the system. A static aquarium is not going to filter very, or, well, or uh, cycle very fast. So you definitely want to have water movement with power filters and filters and wave makers on. Definitely. I think that's something that we've touched about, touched on maybe in a previous Q and A or even in some of our regular podcasts. So if you're listening to this and you have questions, send us a message or go check out our library of podcasts. There's tons of great information. Yeah. I think the problem is people get confused because we don't want the filter socks in. We don't want the UV or the ozonizer on, but those are very specific parts of equipment. We get this you know, I, I poured the bacteria in, I'm doing my cycle. When can I turn the filter on? Well, how about before you put the bacteria in? You, know, you need the water circulating. You need the bacteria being circulated around and so they can establish themselves on the biomedium. So get the filters running and get the bio heads 
uh, power heads running. Yep, exactly. All right, question number five. I used one and only on a new 90 liter aquarium. And I think I made a mistake while cycling because my ammonia dropped to zero, but my nitrite is still reading at one parts per million. According to what I've read, my nitrite should be at zero before I add fish. Is this correct? Is this normal? I've done a 50% water change, but I'm not sure if I should add more bacteria to the tank or if it's good. Can you please help? Thank you. Well, you can always add more one and only to the tank. You can't overdose it. You can add when there's fish in the tank. It's completely non-toxic. Um, now, what the question doesn't say, how many times they've added ammonia. So let's, and, and they're doing a fishless cycling. So there's no mistake here. Um, we expect that the ammonia is going to go to zero first. Those bacteria work faster. And so there's going to be a little nitrite. One is not high. It's if you follow our directions, the most the nitrite should go to is about two. So you're halfway there, which means some's being converted. So at this point, since we're, we've got to make an assumption, they've only added the ammonia once. What we'd recommend is that you follow the next step in the fish cycling recipes, which you can download at our site, uh, drtibsaquatics.com. And add a little bit more ammonia. Your ammonia is gone, your nitrite's one. So add some more ammonia to keep the cycle going. If the nitrite were above two, were a real high, you know, deep reddish colored, I'd say wait another day or two, but right now you're right on line, you're right on target with the, with the cycling. So add some more ammonia drops. All right, it's always, it's always a good thing. Like you're right on track, right where you should be. Yeah. Ooh, this is, this is a fun one. Not, we don't get a lot of questions about our food, but we do have fish food. So this one is, I purchased beneficial fish food and my fish like it. However, I'm wondering how I should use this for the top feeders. Also, I heard somewhere that this food is not good for bettas. Is that true? Uh, it is wonderful for bettas. Um, it's wonderful for all fish. Our fish food does not have grains because fish don't have the amylase enzyme, which is used to digest grains. And that's why fish get um, stringy poop. They get bloat. That upside down goldfish doesn't have something wrong with its swim bladder. It's got a plugged up intestinal tract. Goldfish don't have a stomach. They have a long intestinal tract. And when they're fed grains, they can't digest that. It just sits there and basically they're constipated. It's starting to be broken down and the bacteria producing in gas. So now the gas is lighter than, you know, air and it wants to float up. So the goldfish is swimming upside down. Um, and that's why the old wives tales of peas and brine shrimp, that's a laxative, you know, it helps clear that out, but our food is great for bettas and how to do surface feeding is break it up a little bit between your fingertips so that it's small particles that are along the surface. That's the easiest way to do that. All right. Good advice. Okay. Question number seven, I have started your recipe for battling cyano. As instructed, I turned the skimmer and the UV off. I also have a Clarisee installed. It's a 35 micron roll. Should I bypass the Clarisee and let the, in quotations, dirt into the sump? Not exactly sure what a Clarisee, but it seems like it's one of those roller filters. Yep. At 35 microns, that's going to become clogged quite rapidly. I would bypass that. And the reason is, is it's going to become clogged and start filtering way down. And it's going to start removing bacteria from the water. And we're trying to keep the bacteria in the water so they can fight the cyanobacteria. So definitely bypass that device. And when we say turn off the skimmer, that's only for a little while. You're not leaving the skimmer off for the whole entire treatment because you're converting the nutrients. You're doing two things with the waste away. 
the waste away are getting into the nooks and crannies and crevices and into the substrate under the live rock and all that and degrading the organics that are helping to feed the cyano. And that's producing nutrients as they degrade those organics to grow more of the bacteria in the water to outcompete the cyano. But now you've got to get those bacteria out. And that's what the skimmer does. So you turn it back on. You just turn it off for a little while to let the bacteria population grow. And then you turn the skimmer on to remove the bacteria, thereby removing the nutrients. And that process has got to repeat. So I just want to make sure you're not leaving your skimmer off for three or four days. It's only for an hour or two. And if the water starts to turn cloudy, turn the skimmer back on immediately. And what yes. was the other device they were turned off? Um, the skimmer and the UV, and they were asking about, I guess, if they should take their filter or by bypass the roller filter. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know much history about this tank, but I would say that this tank is one of those that the Sinos do that due to the fact they have everything in the kitchen sink on there. Think about it. The UV is killing bacteria in the water. The skimmer, I don't know if it's oversized or not, but chances are good that it is. Um, that's removing bacteria from the water. And then you have the roller filter that's removing bacteria from the water. And what do all three of those things have in common besides removing bacteria from the water is they don't do anything to cyanobacteria. So, so as I've said many times in these podcasts, the unintended consequence of all that is you are shifting the tank. You're, you're begging the tank to grow cyanobacteria, basically. So... I would put all those on a timer or eliminate one or two of them if you don't need them. I don't think, no. you know, I don't know. I don't know why you would need all those truthfully, but I would definitely run them on uh, timers and alternate when they're off and don't run all three of them at the same time. Yep. All right. So basically the water's too clean. You know, it's funny. Um, I was listening to, you did a podcast on Reef News Network with Peter, and that's one of the things that you guys talked about. And, you know, I think it's something that we've talked about as well. Like there is such a thing as there being too much and it being too clean. Yep. Definitely too clean. Yep. <laughs> All right. Question number eight. And I really like this one. There's a, a lot of parts to it, but I think it's, it's very interesting. So I currently dose EcoBalance daily via a doser with great results. I'm really happy. I currently dose two times the weekly dose broken up into seven increments, one each day at 5 a.m. I turn the UV and the skimmer off for three hours until 8 a.m. I'd like to start doing waste away daily as well at a similar reduced dose via a doser. My question is, can I mix the two products in my dosing bottle and use the same dosing pump. The bottle will hold approximately a 14 day supply of the two products combined. Would this have any adverse effects on the products? Um, that would be my preference, but if not, I can dose the two products via separate dosers at the same time. Would 12 hours apart be an option? So there's a lot there, but interesting question. Yeah, I like this guy. But wish he had before, wish he had sent us before and after pictures. I imagine his tank is looking good and the corals are quite colorful. Um, but the answer is yes, you could mix the two, but you're going to have to, excuse me, <coughs> sorry about this, Hillary. You're going to have to um, experiment on how much you add. The, the waste away bacteria has more strains. They might grow a little faster. You're not going to be able to tell which one is which once you mix them. But what you might notice is that if you put too much bacteria in that mixing vessel and not enough nutrients, it'll, it'll crash. It'll go clear. The bacteria will grow and grow, and then they'll not be able to grow anymore, and they'll start um, crashing and you'll you'll see that as the water clear so i would add the waste away a little bit at a time and maybe even uuh, reduce the amount of equal balance that you're adding or else you're going to have to add more of the nutrient i'm assuming that's first defense that you're adding to the system so you're going to have to balance that a little bit but in general yeah you can add both of them together um and then what was the 12-hour schedule? 
if if they were different, is that what it was implying? If it was one vessel with waste away, one with equal balance, would it be 12 hours apart? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that would be fine. Um, you, you, as long as you're adding a small amount, it really doesn't matter. You're just dripping. You're not pouring a bunch of this bacteria in the mix. You're, you're into the water. You're just trying to drip it in there so the bacteria can go out and find nutrients to consume. That would be, mean a 12 hour schedule would be fine, but you don't have to do separate. They can be together. All right. So yeah, that was, that was a really good question. And if you are the one that sent us this question, you're listening to the podcast. If you have before and after photos, please send them to us. We would love to see. All right. Oh, I think I have a duplicate question here. Hold on. All right. Just listen to your podcast on algae during my tank maintenance. Great info. And what really got me thinking was the lighting. I really tend to do blue in the morning and in the evening, and then bring the whites in with the T5s for four to five hours during the middle of the day. My question is, because you guys talked about the blues being run at 50%, do you think this is a reasonable lighting schedule? Well, the only way to really know that is to know what's going on if it's a coral tank and the corals are healthy and growing and having good color yeah i mean it, any schedule is just a schedule but what are your animals we don't we don't have any information on the animals telling us whether it's good or bad he doesn't the, the reader or the, the questioner doesn't mention whether they're having cyano or any algae problems my answer is if nothing's wrong and you're happy then don't change things you know, just, just to fiddle around to try to make things better, unless you have something, you know, you're chasing out, I need this, I want to eliminate this, I'm trying to do this, there's no reason to adjust things in, in my, in my advice. Does that make sense, Hillary? Yeah, no, absolutely. I actually have a friend that was chasing numbers, but wasn't paying attention and looking at the system and the system was great. It was thriving, you know, corals were growing and, you know, they didn't, they didn't see that because they were too busy making sure that something was textbook and they stopped. I'm like, Oh, I don't need to do all this. I'm good. Yeah. Except of course there isn't a textbook because nobody knows how to uh, knows everything to write enough one, but there's the internet and that'll take the place of a textbook and it'll tell you all sorts of fables more of a <laughs> book of myths. Um, <laughs> sorry, but just because somebody on a blog said, or uh, on a, you know, a forum said, do this, do that, do that. If your animals are healthy, your corals are healthy, the tank is looking great. Enjoy it. Don't be, you know, messing with things because literally, and we say it, and sometimes people say, well, that's just an excuse, but every tank is different. Just the situations, the nutrient levels, it is different. And so you don't, there isn't one, one perfect way to do everything, one exact lighting regime. It all depends on your situation. And if you're happy with it, then enjoy it. Less stress in your life. <laughs> exactly. And on a relatable note, thank you guys for listening to the podcast. We always appreciate, you know, hearing your feedback and hearing that you guys are listening and enjoying it. So keep the questions coming. Oh, we should do this. If you're going to be in Aquashella this weekend, yeah. <laughs> mention the podcast. I'll be there and you'll walk away with some Dr. Tim's swag. How's that? I like that. I like that. I yes. better eliminate that. I mean, we have thousands and thousands of listeners. So to the first uh, 50 people, <laughs> we don't <laughs> and, have unlimited you know, amounts. <laughs> I'm going to tell them that they get bonus swag if they take a photo with you and Susan and share it to social media. Okay, gonna get me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just no, gonna we, put we, out we, there that Aquashella is having a costume contest. Mm -hmm. You guys gotta stop by the booth. Um, <laughs> this, All right, last this question. Weekend, this weekend in Texas at the, I think it's at the Dallas market. You can look it up, Aquashella. It's always a good time, really good turnout. And if you're listening to this, like I'll put a plug in for, I mean, we don't, we just participate. It's got everything for kids, beginners, families, freshwater, saltwater, shrimp, 
plants, you know, it's a nice aquatic weekend. It's not just some, uh, you know, frag swap, you know, it's not that at all, but nothing wrong with the frag swap, but it's got a lot of different things. And if you're interested in anything aquarium wise, it's worth to come out and spend a few hours there and check things out. They had a really cool, my favorite still of all the shows. One year I saw a kangaroo out of yeah. Coachella and you sent me a photo of this beautiful panther chameleon just wow blows your mind yeah. not not fish related at all but no nope. nope. goes to show you how much cool stuff they have yeah. nope. so and we will be having um JJ yep yep doing He's a, going to be doing a live aquascape at hold on I've got to check the time it's either at noon or at one I'll post it on social media again um, so you can come by and watch that as well. Yeah, those guys are real artists, uh, how they aquascape these tanks. It's amazing. So it's Beautiful. a skill for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last question. I'm talking about shows. It was great meeting you at Reefa Palooza. I have a couple of questions. So I'm dealing with some cyano in our main system. It's mainly on the sand bed and I can't quite figure it out. Any bacterial suggestions? Well, I mean, my bacterial selection uh, suggestion is always going to be to add some waste away. But this is where I get in. We started out with like, one of the first questions was lighting. If, if your cyano is only growing on spots out, you know, directly under your lights on the substrate, my question is always, do you need to be running your blues at what you're running them? which is typically people just turn them on and, and they're running at a hundred percent and you don't need to run blue lights at a hundred percent in most tanks because the blue is the intense light. It's the one that goes the deepest in water. That's why when you're scuba diving, things are bluish shade and you might be putting too much light into the system. So the first thing I would do definitely get some bacteria in the system but start ratcheting down that blue, you know, go down to 90, 80. You know, most, in most cases, unless you're running a tank that's over 24 inches deep in water um, and with just lots of coral, you know, hard, the harder, harder corals that need lots of light, running that blue that in, at that high range is probably what's promoting that sign. And when people say it's just always there, I can never get rid of it. First thing I would do is, is check your uh, blue light channel, turn that down, uh, put the skimmer on a timer, and then uh, start adding some waste away. Or a great way is just the waste away gels. That's our waste away bacteria in a time release gel. You put it in the sump, the tank, the filter, and for 30 days, just releases a little bit of bacteria into the system to help get rid of the nutrients and the organics that are in the system to help combat the dinos and the cyanos and things like that. All right, good to know. I feel like a lot of blue light questions or blue light solutions. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, you know, the the actinic came out, you know, this long time ago, and now you've got the blues and, and they're fine, except there's no reason to run all this intense light. I think we talked about that uh, last week on on the you know how daylight, you know, in a coral reef, the sun comes up and goes to its highest point at noon and then goes down. It isn't the same intensity. <laughs> The whole 12 hours, 10 hours, the light that the sun is up. So mimic that in your reef tank. You don't need to have that blue on that intense for, for eight hours. You're going to start growing algae more than likely. Yep. All right. Well, those are all of the questions that I have today. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we need to add. We got a question today, and you know, people are talking about some of their uh, these filtration systems, and uh, more. It's more like lighting. You know, they want to run the one today. I don't know if you saw it, Hillary. The person's talking about having the blue and royal spectrum at one hundred percent or one hundred twenty percent, and so, so as I mentioned. To adjust things just to adjust things is not a recommendation that I make. It's, I'm having this issue. I have spots of sino. 
my corals aren't looking good. I have dino. You know, what, what issue is your tank having? And then kind of make a mental checklist. Okay, that's photosynthetic. Am I running my lights too much? It's uh, benthic, meaning it grows on a surface. Does that mean I don't have enough bacteria to combat that, to counteract that? I'm running three or four different things, UV, skimmer, uh, refugia, algae scrubber, these uh, toilet paper rolls. That's not what they're called, but I'm, you know what I'm talking about, where you were filtering all this stuff where we're over filtering. You know, you've got a MacGyver aquarium, where, you know, everything is in there. Then you start dialing those things back. But just, just to, you know, should I run 100%, 120% down to 70%? Honestly, I can't answer that question because every tank is different. And does your tank have an issue? You, you know, if, if you've got, you've seen these tanks, people, where they're just gorgeous. The, the, fil the coral colors are almost like they're unreal. They're so nice. Okay. If that's the tank you have or want, first find that person whose tank is like that and, and quiz them about what they're doing and try to mimic that. But, you know, chances are, yes, they're running a lot of light, and, but chances are they're also doing lots of other things to get there. It's usually not just one thing. That, that benefits you or one thing that's negative. It's a buildup of things. But just to adjust things is not really the way to go in, in my recommendations. Listen to your tank. Yep, yep. You, you got to watch, you know, that's why, why, that's why it's there to look at. So observe it and see how things change. And come on, everybody's got a phone. So it isn't hard to snap a few pictures to see how things are doing. You know, compare them month to month. A, a one time, a snapshot at one time over the course of six months or years, you know, it, it's not really going to help us. Things getting better, things getting worse. Where are things? Yes. You know, what now what this person's asking is that they seem to think that the lack of growth that they find with decreasing the spectrum is far. Uh, far less worth than the extra precaution for the algae bloom. So there's a trade-off there. They're looking for max growth. So they're adding lots of light. But as you try to do that, you risk getting algae growth. So if that's, you, you know that, how do you combat that? Well, you've got to know and be observe, observing things. And then maybe I've got to add some more bacteria to keep those excess nutrients out of the system cut back on removing bacteria from the water by putting the skimmer on a timer. Don't have four or five different things that are limiting bacteria in the system. That's how I would approach that. So, exactly. Yeah. But again, and I'll, I'll step off the soapbox box just to adjust things to adjust things is, is, you know, that that's just turning knobs in the dark. You don't know what you're going to do and yeah, whether it's going to have any benefit. Trouble. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, everyone. Hillary, it's been another great time talking to you. Always look forward to it on our podcast. And yes, it's uh, always a fun learning experience. So everyone, please keep the questions coming. And uh, we're, we're always wanting to talk to people, try to get back to people at our social media or at info at drtimsaquatics.com. And until next time, this is Dr. Tim and Hillary. And thanks for listening in.